Welcome to Invested in Climate. Protecting the planet and decarbonizing the global economy is the challenge of our time. Never before have so many people rallied around a common cause. We all have a role to play, and the opportunity we face is unprecedented. Invested in Climate aims to help people do more to address climate change through their work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism. I'm your host, Jason Rissman. I co-lead a climate venturing practice at the design firm IDEO, supporting early stage climate founders and organizations. I'm also an investor and startup advisor, and have realized that when it comes to climate action, I'll be a lifelong learner looking for the best ways to have a climate positive impact. If you like what you hear, give us a good rating on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you found us. Follow us on social, subscribe, and spread the word. Find episodes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. Thanks for joining. For every car that's made in the US, we make eight new parking spaces for it, which is absurd because now city centers are just parking lots. What about affordable housing? How do we build more houses for people to live and make it more affordable? Is we need to convert parking lots into more affordable houses. Cars should not be parked. They should always be driving around moving people from point A to point B, and not just be housed. To address climate change, there's little doubt that we need to replace gas-powered cars with electric vehicles. But is owning an EV actually needed? What if, rather than buying a car that remains parked most of the time, electric vehicles could just appear when we need them? That's the bold vision of Anand Nandakumar, founder of the startup Halo Car. It's the convenience of Lyft or Uber, combined with the freedom of Zipcar, enabled by technology, and a team of remote pilots. I had a blast talking to Anand and think you'll enjoy his big thinking and great insights to transportation, cities, urban design, the future, and more. So buckle up. Here we go. Hello, Anand. Welcome to Invested in Climate. Thank you for having me here, Jason. It's great to have you. Where do we find you today? I'm based in Las Vegas at the moment in my office, and it's a little toasty outside, but it's fantastic. Yeah, I think I saw over 100 degrees this week. Do people even go outside when it's that hot on a daily basis there? Yeah, you try not to. You want to stick inside. (laughs) All of our AC is cranked on full blast, and it's still warm inside, so it's a nice day. Well, great to have you here. Let's dive in. So many questions for you. I'm really excited to learn more about what you're doing. Why don't we start off and just hear about the company that you're building? What is Halo Car and what's the problem that you're aiming to solve? I kind of have to give a little bit of premise before what Halo is all about and the problem that we generally want to solve and how Halo is going to help. I started this company three and a half years ago because I wanted to make a big climate impact. Carbon emissions are the biggest problem that we need to solve for humanity. By 2030, we have some massive goals that we need to hit for the planet Earth. And if we were to hit these milestones, we need to really radically rethink transportation. So all of transportation has to move towards electric. We're super stuck and super dependent on gasoline cars at the moment. If we try to unpack what's happening in the electrification market, is the biggest problem is rapid acceleration for masses into electric cars. That is the biggest blocker. And the biggest reasoning behind that is car ownership. The only way a consumer gets access to an electric car today is via private car ownership, which means that private electric cars are about $40,000 start off. Not everybody's able to afford it. Right off the bat, a huge population is not able to afford it. And even if you're able to afford that car and you go out and buy it from a dealer or whatnot, you still have to retrofit your house with some form of charging infrastructure. So you can actually charge your car. You can actually drive it. You don't have to be always looking for charging stations outside. This eliminates another big chunk because when you rent a car, rent a house, you can't retrofit your house. If you are, you know, in an apartment, you can't do it. So general masses are not still able to retrofit the houses. So right off the bat, with these two big problems, majority are not able to move to electric cars. The last but not least, when we generally buy cars, it's just parked 23 hours in the day or 96% of the lifetime of the car is just literally parked. So we barely drive it one hour a day. Electric cars today are very high resource intensive manufacturing process. If you see gasoline cars have taken hundreds of years before they've optimized the manufacturing process, but electric cars are still very early in the infant stage of manufacturing, which means that it takes about 800 tons of carbon dioxide emitted 
for every single EV that is produced today in the production line. It takes 10 plus years to offset that carbon at this rate of utilization that is barely driving one hour a day. This is not sustainable. The equation has to flip somewhere to a point where how do we make EVs high utilization? That is, how can we drive the cars majority of the time, like 20 hours a day, 23 hours a day even, and have it only parked for one hour of maintenance or charging? That is the problem Halo is solving. That is why I started the company in the first place. If you see Halo today, after three and a half years, we're launching the first commercial service very, very shortly. It's quite interesting merge between a zip car and a ride share service, right? For our customers, they take our app, request a car. We will remotely drive an all electric vehicle to a consumer's doorstep of wherever they are. Once it gets there, they hop in the driver's seat, they take over the car and they drive it to wherever they want to go. And once they get to the destination, parking is the biggest problem. That's why people converted into rideshare services so fast because they just didn't want to park their car. Same way in a Halo, they never have to park the car. They just drive it to the destination and simply hop off and walk away. We then remotely connect to the car and drive it to the next customer. So that is the best of both worlds. Right? You have the benefits of a car share service and the benefits of a rideshare service combined into one product. Fantastic. There's so much that I want to dive in there. Why don't we first just learn a little bit more about you? You as a founder and your story, you shared what's, I think, a really compelling and clear argument for the need for electrifying all vehicles, but also really changing mobility uh, in cities in particular. How did you get to this clear vision? And you know, what is the story of what led up to you founding Halo Car? Myself, I come from India, in a very, very lower middle class family, very top environment, did my bachelor's computer engineering there, and then moved to England did my master's in uh, you know, computer engineering as well with a really good you know, segue into machine learning. That's why I started learning about machine learning. I'm going to date myself a little bit right now. That was about 17 years ago. Super, super infant stage of machine learning. Nobody knew what that was. There was no courses for it. There's no curriculum for it. A few months ago, my grandmother was talking about machine learning. So the world has changed quite a lot, right? After finishing my master's, obviously, I didn't get a chance to, you know, work in that field. So I had to find a way to survive, just do tech jobs here and there. My first job out of master's was a hardware engineer in, at Vodafone. And I was responsible for integrating some of the intricate sensors into a cell phone, try to find a way to localize the cell phone as accurately as possible. This was back in 2004. And then after that, uh, I was there for a few years. We were responsible for integrating one of the first GPS chipsets in a cell phone. And we were able to really accurately pinpoint where a cell phone was and then start delivering video content to it after you are able to localize a cell phone. That led me into a whole realm of video streaming where YouTube was just starting. So I learned really low level how video streaming just works at scale. And around 2013, 2014, AlexNet came out. And machine learning just was put in the spotlight. Like deep learning was put in the spotlight. Deep nets was just coming out. That's when I was like, you know, this is what I would like to do. And I went back into that field, um, set up one of the first ever, you know, small research teams in one of the organizations. I can't talk much about it, but uh, uh, that gave me an opportunity to be really heavily plugged into the machine learning space and deep learning space, specifically for computer vision. And after several years, Uber reached out uh, with their self-driving division, and it was extremely correlating to what I was doing. I really wanted to jump into transportation because I see that's the biggest impact that we can do, moving people around. It's just going to be a big impact. That's why I left Uber, where I, I, I led their perception division for their, for their self-driving cars and truck program. So it was really insightful to see how transportation could be really thought through in a very different way, working in an organization like that that has radically changed the way we move around an environment in a city. That was a huge wake up into the entire transportation segment. And then after a while, that both transportation and my hunger for making a big impact in climate combined forces. And Uber was going through a lot of transition internally, specifically the software division was going through a lot of transition internally. 
And I wanted to leave to go do a different vision or, you know, run behind a different vision, which was Halo. After several iterations, um, Halo is where it's at today. We initially just literally started building our own cars. Happy to talk about that, but uh, that was a very tough journey to start off. Really emotional roller coaster. When you're starting a car company, it's just not as easy. And then, you know, slowly iterated towards where we're at today. Okay, let's dive into a bit of what makes Halo Car really different and, and special. You mentioned Zipcar, and there's other startups that have worked in the market of sharing cars, and yet Halo is different. Uh, and I think one of the main differences is, is this idea that the car comes to you and you don't need to park it. That, of course, requires some, some interesting innovations on your side. Tell us a bit more about how you make that happen. Yeah, so we clearly decided that making our own cars is not our secret sauce. And that was just an incredibly challenging problem to solve. And lots of big players, big companies we all know are working on it. Where we saw that we were going to add value was this retrofit kit that we designed internally and built it internally that could be retrofitted into a existing standalone vehicle platform. That became the pivotal moment where we realized that. And we tried attempting, we tried integrating that into our first vehicle. It was a Kia Soul uh, back in 2020. And then we were able to reverse engineer the whole stack and learn how the internals of the car worked. And then we combined that into our stack. And that's when we had the Eureka moment. That's when we were like, okay, this could actually work. So to make a Zipcar have the same customer experience as Uber, we needed to do two main things. One is on the customer side, the car just should just magically arrive because, you know, Uber has done that, right? When you push a button, the car just shows up. Boom. That was a magic, right? The second part of that was we just can't scale having a driver in a car that delivers the car and just rides back to our garage or warehouse, right? That's just not going to be scalable. So which means that we needed to remove the dependency on a human involved in every single vehicle when we actually start scaling. That's when the idea of putting them remote comes into play and right? putting them in a mission control where they're able to monitor the fleet of cars and they can you know, jump into any of the car in the fleet and reposition them for a customer to jump in was a huge unlock. After we were able to retrofit that car with our own stack, we started testing it in San Mateo. We had the safety driver inside and 99% was me and one of my friends was actually in the garage trying out the stack and trying to drive it remotely. Lots and lots and lots of failures. We had so many issues with connectivity. We had so many issues with getting the right antennas, the right modems, the right devices, the right compute, the right GPU. What kind of encoders do we need to use? What kind of decoders do we need to use? So many challenges. We just opened a can of worms. That went into a huge rabbit hole of where, how do we make this reliable? To give you a context, there are two main things a person that is going to drive a car remotely has to face. One is the quality of the video, that is pixelation and quality of the video. Right? They should be able to see everything really clearly so they can actually see it. it's a lane line, it's a traffic light, it's a stop sign. Right, that's a one big one. The second is the connection has to be absolutely pristine and reliable, which means that in a, in a Zoom call or a video call, it's okay for it to freeze, but nothing will happen, right? But here, you can't have a small freeze. Even a one or two millisecond level freeze throws off the remote pilot. We had to go to the lowest possible level to make that connection extremely reliable. That's where some of our core IP, core tech comes into play, where we have all the networks in the car, quite literally. Every possible network we can get hands on, it's there in the car. We have a very proprietary way of leveraging all those network strengths and predicting ahead of time if one of the networks is stronger than the other one. So we, we kind of do a lot of dynamic load balancing in terms of how do we push the data packets to the actual remote pilot. Coming back to the freezes for a second, the reason why a frame or video freezes is because of most of the time it's because of packet losses. So we had to get to a point where there are really no packet loss. By leveraging a lot of networks, we are able to create the reliability first. And a very unique way to push packets onto multiple networks gives us a unique advantage of 
increase in the reliability and redundancy of the actual connection. So it took us two years to near perfect it. We're still not perfect to near perfect the tech. And we got to a point where we saw the light at the end of the tunnel. That is like, hey, I can actually get this deployed. I can actually get this to public markets and, and the roads with actual customers. That's when, you know, regulations just came in. That was a big second wall. How do we make a legislator or a government agency to say, okay, this is okay for you to launch in our cities? When you start going to talk to cities and states and sharing, hey, this is what we're going to do. We're going to remotely drive a 4,000 pound beast on public roads with nobody inside. Can you allow us to do it? I note that you're in a gambling town right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the conversations you could imagine how it went. It was a big challenge. It was a big difficulty to elaborate how we're problem solving this, how we're making this so reliable. And in the course of doing that, some of the carriers, the, the actual network providers took notice of this. T-Mobile was the first partner for us. They uh, looked at under the hood exactly how we're building all this and then realized that we have something very unique that never seen before. So they said, okay, we need to partner with this company because the tech and the IP they're building is extremely unique and very correlating to what 5G was actually built for. So the whole you know, 5G network is incredible. The way it's engineered and deployed is just a huge challenge for humanity. And they have been solving that for almost a decade, right? And here comes a incredible use case where that bandwidth and the latency could be actually leveraged to make a huge impact in humanity, in society. So that's when we both aligned forces and saying, hey, we would like to have low-level access to the network so we can actually see where the packet loss really happens when the life of packet goes from the car to all the way to the remote pilot's console. That became extremely important, valuable uh, partnership for us. One thing led to another, and we started talking to a lot of states and regulators and policymakers and saying, hey, where could be a first possible launch? And it was very clear California is going to be very difficult to convince. Most of the regulators there just didn't want to take our meetings, didn't want to sit with us and go into deep conversations with us. And we just felt like this is not going to be the state. So we took a step back and said, if we were to make this company work, we needed to take a different approach. That is not just go deploy and ask for forgiveness for good forgiveness later. Instead, make the regulators our partners. I really wanted to make that chapter happen for us. So that's why we started working with about six different states. And out of that, Nevada and Las Vegas just stood out. They were just so progressive. They were very open-minded about new tech. I came here in January 2021 and met with the all during COVID, I right? met with the, the city staff members and city folks and regulators and policymakers and all locally here. And I saw that they were super interested. They wanted this to happen. They see the vision. They see the reality. They see the opportunity it's going to bring to the city and the state. And they were very progressive about how do we make this happen? That's when I decided I can't be in California. So I moved the company two weeks later to Nevada. All of our cars came here. We started road testing literally two weeks after that conversation in Las Vegas. And on the other side of remote driving also strikes me as challenging and potentially dangerous that even if you solve the packet loss issue, which sounds like you've made a lot of progress on, you still need to train and trust drivers that are behind a screen rather than actually sitting in the car. How have you handled that challenge? Yeah, luckily we have a lot of inspiring people who've done this before. If you see the Air Force has done this before, they have unmanned drones. They've been flying for well over a decade and training veterans well, well over a decade in how to fly these drones several thousand miles away. So we definitely took inspiration from that. We took inspiration from uh, trucking industry where they have really tight regulations on how many hours a truck driver can drive, how much break they need to take. All of this kind of came together for us. It's not an easy challenge. It's a, it's a very difficult challenge. Uh, we hit a big milestone last week where it was the first time ever a paid remote pilot drove our cars on public roads. So that was a big milestone. It took a lot of effort before that actually happened. We just don't take anybody in as a remote pilot. 
we do a significant background check, their driving record, their actual history to make sure that they are they really have a good background for it. Number two is before they start driving a car, they go through a really rigorous training process. We train them in-house, internally. We educate them how the stack works. They talk to our engineers. They talk to our teams. Really get a good grasp about how it actually works. Then the next step, what we do is we put them in the car and one of our prior trained remote pilot has a credible background, incredible and you know, miles under belt, drives remotely so they can get a feel for how the car reacts inside. How is it going through intersections? How is it going through traffic lights? That kind of low level feel gives them a perception of how the car is actually driving when somebody's driving it remotely. Then the next step is they come into our actual work, whole week training session where they go through the full training pipeline and then they they observe existing uh, remote pilots that are actually driving. Then they, they not only shadow, they actually switch. They start driving in parking lots first with a safety driver inside the car and one of our remote pilots that are seasoned monitoring them and shadowing them. So they go through these kind of step-by-step process of training before they can actually put a single mile on the public road fully remote. So it's a quite rigorous process. So you're starting in Vegas and hoping to grow. You know, I thought that what happens in Vegas is supposed to stay in Vegas, but you're (laughs) going to grow. Tell us about those growth plans. When will you be launching on the streets in Vegas and how long until Halo is more widespread and what are your biggest challenges to scaling? The number one thing is we're launching next week and beta. It's a huge, huge, huge milestone for the company. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you very much. The beta is going to be very interesting. It's going to be with a safety driver inside the car and paid remote pilots are driving it with actual customers that can request the cars, request for the rides, and actually they will pay for the rides as well. That's the first time a actual customer is going to pay for one of our rides. So that's going to be a huge milestone for us next week. Right? So we call this the beta launch, where we launch it in downtown Las Vegas, specifically focused on a small geofenced area in downtown region where customers actually reside and companies actually are based off of. That's the first big milestone for us. Later this year, depending on how our testing goes, how our process goes, how our iterations go, how our builds go, we will remove the safety driver. That's when we'll have a official commercial launch, and that's going to be a big event. You'll hear a lot more about that very, very soon, but that's going to be a big event that's going to be brewing. That's when we're going to be disclosing exactly how our entire tech works internally, our IP works internally, what we've really done to actually remove the safety driver. That's going to be a really big launch. Right? And we're also disclosing that uh, DMV of uh, Nevada has given us a first commercial permit to launch a service like this. There's no permit like this ever done before. So I'm super, super pumped and excited to share that. The DMV of Nevada has given us the, the, the first permit. Right, That's a huge, huge unlock for us. Next year is where we'll be targeting multiple states, multiple uh, cities in multiple states nationwide. There's a small chance that we could go international, but it's a very, very small chance. But mostly it's going to be nationwide in the U.S. that you can see start scaling. In terms of what challenges that we need to solve, obviously significant amount of tech challenges that we need to solve for uh, not only for this first deployment, but also for the growth of the first deployment. So we'll have a small fleet of cars that will scale about 30 to 50 cars by end of the year. But next year it's going to be several thousand. To get to that level of scale, since we're doing all of operations internally, that is going to be a big challenge. Operations is going to be a huge chapter that we're going to start in the company. Until now, it has it has been engineering and R&D and commercializing the engineering product and productionizing every part of the hardware, productionizing every part of the software. That has been a big, big, big challenge. But we're going to face a significant operational challenge, which also includes how do you raise capital for these cars? The CapEx are not cheap. It's not like a software product that you just launch as a SaaS company and it starts scaling globally, right? Every car is expensive. It's about $40,000 to start off and, and then our retrofit stack on top of that. So the cost of that capital for that car is, are pretty high, which means that we, especially in this market right now, we need to be extremely cautious about unit economics, right? No matter what, the companies always have to be cautious of the unit economics, so which means that we have to really look at our utilization of the entire fleet as well. Those are some of the biggest challenges that we're going to face very, very soon in the company. 
Tell us about the cars themselves. I imagine you're somewhat of an expert on electric vehicles. Uh, and you probably spend a lot of time thinking about which cars to select and work with. What cars are you offering now? Or are you working with? And why did you pick them? The first vehicle platform that we chose was the Kia Nero EV. In a, in a lot of ways, a startup only has a very limited set of resources. So we have to hyper-focus or laser-focus our efforts into making the first milestone, hitting the first milestone. This might sound a little lazy, but uh, uh, the first vehicle that we chose was a Kia Soul. It's also an EV, and that I personally reverse-engineered everything, every part of it, and I rec- integrated the full stack and made that first stack work. So we had a you know prior learning from it, right? For the most part, OEMs don't change a lot of the internal electronics when it comes to next version or even a bigger form factor. They try to retain it as much as possible because the cost comes down if you retain the same components. So that went in handy for us. So we then switched over to the Kia Nero, the EV version of it, which goes 260 miles. And unlike the first Soul, which only barely went 60 miles on a single charge, uh, heavier battery pack for that low range. Um, and smaller form factor. So we wanted something a little bit bigger, like a crossover is a perfect hybrid between a sedan and a SUV. So that's why we targeted a little bigger vehicle form factor, and we wanted a higher range. We wanted at least 200 miles. At that time, right around 2019, 2020, the first vehicle that would do that was a Kia Nero. And that was the first one that actually did north of 200 miles on a single charge. We got one of those, and we started integrating our stack to it. And it was basically transferable right off the bat. That's when we realized, okay, this is this is the platform that we want to stick with. And although we had a lot of opportunities to um, try out different vehicle form factors, we just didn't want to do it. Part of making a company successful is you get to say no to a thousand ideas. So part of that was we had to say no to a lot of form factors. But the way we built the stack was it's transferable. It could be transferred to pretty much any vehicle form factor that is EV. And the beauty of EVs also is outside of making a climate impact, because we want more people to use EVs, is EVs are a software car. It's driven by software for the most part. Right? So if we are able to tap into that software, we're able to control the vehicle quite comfortably. So that was a huge unlock for us too. Instead of adding actuators or actual motors inside the car, we were able to just leverage existing infrastructures already inside the car. So that brought the cost down, the integration time down, and our own engineering time down. Right? That was a huge unlock for us. We're, we started exploring some other form factors um, a, a couple of months ago, but nothing is going to come out anytime soon. We want to stick to the Kia Nero to start off, get the fleet out, get the utilization, get customers to use it. And then we we explore other form factors. We have, we're in deep discussions with some biggest OEMs at the moment, but uh, nothing is concrete yet. You mentioned growing internationally, potentially, potentially as soon as within the next couple of years. And I know that you said that you grew up in India. Do you expect Halo to eventually have a presence there? And and really, how global of a company do you expect Halo can be? If I were to target the TAM, it's in several trillion because. Think about where we're at today. The entire world is literally in early 1910s of where the gasoline car industry was. And Ford just put out the first car, you know, like Hertz put out the first rental fleet early days in the 19th, right? That's where the EV industry is today. The number of cars are less than 2% of, uh, you know, annual sales goes towards EVs. So the TAM that we see for Halo is ginormous like multi-trillions at one point we feel like nobody will buy cars anymore it will just become a service model you push a button a car just shows up and you use it how much of you want and you pay for what you use and you don't worry about parking and it's happens to be an ev right we're not shoving ev down your throat just happens to be it so not only is it effective not only is it convenient affordable, at the same time, it's environmentally friendly. That's the kind of market we want to create. Internationally, coming back to India, I would love to take this to India, but that opens up another whole challenge. Uh, How do we do it? If I were to see the vision, it might have to be a lot smaller form factor. It can't be a crossover. 
it has to be a lot significantly lower, a smaller form factor with a smaller footprint, physical footprint. And the beauty of India, though, is at the moment, India is going through an incredibly radically changing environment where their GDP is going to explode. The tech scene is already exploding like crazy. India is just starting to explore deep tech, early infancy of deep tech at the moment. For the most part, it has been SaaS companies and crypto companies that are exploding. But deep tech is just about to start. The green tech is just about to start in India. It's in very, very infant stage. So we see a huge opportunity there. How do we get there? I honestly don't know, man. I want to go deeper into the vision that you have. Um, before I go there, just to define a term, you referenced TAM. Uh, and for listeners that aren't familiar with that, that just means total addressable market. And I think that your technical term uh, for it was that it's ginormous uh, for Halo. <laughs> uh, but you also said in the trillions. It's really a way to size the market. But back to your vision. One thing that I love about Halo is that you're really rethinking mobility in a radical way. Not just the idea of car ownership, but also the accessibility and convenience of accessing cars um, and in many ways how cars themselves work and our relationship with them. It makes me wonder, how do you see the future of mobility in urban design? What's your vision for how will we all get around in the future and how will cities be different as a result? Oh, man, Jason, what a beautiful question, man. All big ideas start from very, very small inspiration. For me, the inspiration was, uh, you know, back in India, we would take the trains a lot. When I grew up there, there were no, very rarely somebody would take an airplane. I've never been an airplane until I was almost 19 or 20 years old. For the most part, we'll just take the trains. But what was interesting was when you get off of a train station in India, there are these auto rickshaws. A three-wheeled, very small form factor. It will take about two to three people, but we will manage to fit five or seven people somehow. And it was just like a very small, like 29cc, maybe 50cc small petrol engines that would power them. But they would be parked right outside the train stations. So it was so convenient. You could actually take a train from wherever you were, which origination city, and then get to your destination. You simply hop out. There are 50, 100 different autos that you can just jump in and you get to your last mile. That was a huge inspiration for me. When I came to the U.S., it was so different. U.S. is so addicted. America is so addicted to cars and the car ownership. It's embedded into our culture here. I'm not saying it's wrong but it's just not sustainable. Think about the number of freeways that we have right now. The number of lanes are only getting bigger, adding more and more lanes, but the traffic is not going down. Go to LA, if you plan a trip to Los Angeles, you need to plan to be stuck in traffic. That's how it is today, right? This is not scalable. The future vision that I see is a honestly a multimodal way to get around anywhere. The federal government has invested trillions towards public transit systems, but they're heavily underutilized because of first and last mile problems. People can't get from their home to a public transit system and just a schedule. You have to keep track of all the schedules, right? If we do a good job with Halo, the way I can see that is not only to replacing the whole concept of car ownership, but also a multimodal transportation option. You know, scooter companies try to do that quite heavily, but scooter companies had their own challenges. The vision for, say, a company like Bird and Lime was how do we move them away from a gigantic you know, single occupant car into a small little form factor that is super easy, maneuverable, economical, and efficient to connect public transit systems. That was a huge vision, but unfortunately, it's a really difficult challenge to solve with a scooter company because it is not only environmentally friendly end of the day because scooters break down after three, four months, they have to be dumped somewhere, right? This is not a sustainable model. But if we were to replace that with, say, a, a car, completely EV, that could, be, that could be charged at a local charging station that generates local energy, the whole concept becomes extremely scalable. Now we're able to move people from their home into a public transit system really fast, extremely, extremely fast, and the utilization of public transit systems go up and the carbon footprint for that last mile and the first mile goes down drastically. People don't own cars anymore, which means that the number of parking lots will come out. I'll give you a stat right now. This is just is astounding when I found this. For every car that's made in the U.S., we make eight new parking spaces for it. Mm, wow. 
which is absurd because now city centers are just parking lots. What about affordable housing? How do we build more houses for people to live and make it more affordable? Is we need to convert parking lots into more affordable houses. Cars should not be parked. They should always be driving around, moving people from point A to point B and not just be housed. It could be housed outside of city centers where it could be charged and say, like, for instance, in, in New York, cars could be parked in Brooklyn, come in in peak hours automatically with nobody inside into the city centers and move people around drastically and go outside and alleviate the traffic when they needs to be maintained or charged or cleaned or sensor swapped. But the city centers could be walkable. City centers could be that, you know, 15 minute walk city or bicycle city, super friendly for low friction mo- mobility and modality. That's the vision I really see happening. And another vision is in terms of like, instead of going towards car ownership, it could be a subscription model where one subscription model encompasses everything from the first mile, last mile, a public transit system. Or if you're just taking five people with you, it might be economical for you to drive the whole car yourself with five people inside to your destination instead of taking a public transit system, right? These kind of creative ways to move people around comes in super handy. Because if you see sometimes middle of the day, public transit systems are so heavily underutilized, like a bus just runs by itself. There's a driver inside for the most part. So if we're able to push more people into a bus system or a transit system, not only the HLS goes up, but we can also get creative. Halo could complement a public transit network where the bus doesn't have to move two people from point A to point B. It could be a halo that's moving the small amount of people from point A to point B. What about autonomous vehicles? Are you a believer in the autonomous future of cars? And I know that you've invested a lot in a remote infrastructure. So I'm curious, will Halo always rely on remote drivers or will an autonomous vehicles create a different chapter for you? Autonomous cars will need to happen. It needs to happen for improving safety, reliability, efficiency. It needs to happen. But the way we're approaching that right now, I'm doubtful it will happen in less than 15 years. It's going to take quite a bit of infrastructure change for that to be commercially viable. You can call a small little deployment here and there, a couple of roads here and there, nighttime, late night when the traffic is super low. You can call all those things as a deployment in in PR, but that is not scalable. The way I see it working is, let me take a a little step back. This is going to be a little bit, uh, you know, philosophical for a second. If you see industrial automation, it's a really good inspiration for us. Several hundred years ago, when we started manufacturing, like literally concept of manufacturing, and not just like make a product at home for our home use, we had to have factory workers. We built a factory and factory workers would come into the assembly line, build every part of a product, and it's, it gets sold to consumers. The World War II kind of created a huge revolution there, which was we needed to ramp up our manufacturing if we were to, if America was to, you know, stay ahead of the curve there. And what that interestingly introduced was robotics, some form of automation in the, in the process of manufacturing something. Robots and humans slowly started working together. For instance, mundane tasks were taken over by a robot while majority of the task was done by human. You fast forward that idea to like, say, you walk into an Amazon warehouse. If you had a chance to walk into an Amazon warehouse, it's remarkable where 95, 98% of the tasks are done by robots is zipping at 40 miles an hour right next to each other. And a very small fraction of supervision is done by humans. This is quite remarkable how that actually transitioned over. What I see in the autonomous world today or AV world today or autonomous vehicle world today is we lost touch of that. We're going straight to full automation. That is, if you see the levels of automation and autonomy, there are six levels, right? Level zero through level five. For for the audience, I would like to explain that really fast, really rapidly. Level zero is a car with no automation, right? Just like imagine your 1990 Toyota Camry right? or Toyota Corolla, where you had to drive everything yourself and it barely even had a cruise control. It had nothing, right? A level one is like a simple cruise control where you set a speed and the car is super dumb. It doesn't do anything. It just follows the speed and just keeps going. Even if it hits a tree, the car is still running at the speed. It's trying to keep up the speed. That is just level one. 
A level two stack is where it gets very, very interesting. A level two is where the car has a little bit more intelligence. It knows where the lane lines are. It knows where a lead vehicle is. It tries to match the speed, even if you set the speed control or cruise control to say 55 miles an hour. If the, the vehicle in front of you is going at 34 miles an hour, the car keeps maintaining that speed and matching the speed and also keeps your car inside the lane. Level three gets you know, step up, huge step up there, where car starts to understand stop signs, traffic lights, traffic pattern, pedestrians, bicycles, all kinds of stuff that a human realizes level three happens where the car does majority of the work, like but 90%, I would say, depending on where the environment is. And in the geofence area, the car does majority of the work, and then a human inside the car becomes a supervisor, right? They, they look at it, observe it, make sure it's doing the right thing, and you take over when you want to take over, very similar to your cruise control, right? That's level three. Level four is where most of the autonomous vehicle companies are targeting, which is the car does 100% of that journey in a geofenced area with a high-definition map. That is level four. It's a really complex one. Think about this, right? Humans are really good at understanding a difficult challenge and breaking the challenge down and solving that in real time. We're so good at it and understanding edge cases and solving that in real time. We're so, so good at it. And cars are not even close, not even close to where it needs to be. We're basically trying to solve AGI for level four. That's where the industry is at today. And what we're saying is we understand that it's a noble vision, noble strategy for you to go there, but you're going to burn billions and billions and billions and only overpromise and underdeliver. But instead, why don't we start with humans first? Take the inspiration for industrial robotics. Let remote humans drive it remotely. That way we create the efficiency in the business side and economics to actually scale a fleet profitably globally and get access to EVs first. And then what happens after that is you can now merge automation into the equation. A simple level two combined with a remote pilot enables a remote pilot to go faster speeds, cover bigger zone of operation, get even more safer. So all those kind of benefits to start unlocking if you're merging you know, automation with humans, just like what we did in back in industrial automation. So that is the vision that we see, the step-by-step -step approach to getting to the level of automation that we want. Another big thing that unlocks here is, you know, there was a survey made where um, I think 75% of Americans said, I would not get into an autonomous car. It's because we've never seen it. Think about the last time. When was the last time you saw a self-driving car by itself, right? With nobody inside. General population has not seen it yet. We're still used to a human sitting behind the wheel and driving the car. That's all we know. That's what we've seen from when we were little kids. All of a sudden, if we say, we're going to drop driverless cars, right? And there's going to be nobody behind the wheel. In fact, not only that, we're going to put you in the back seat. We're going to close you off so you can't grab the wheel if you see something happens. Right. Just too quick of a shift in how we do everything, but also just our comfort level. That's fascinating. And I imagine very exciting for you is if the autonomous uh, shift is 15 years away, then the value of the remote stack that you are building is all the more incredible. And I'm sure you're thinking about all sorts of different use cases and extensions and different opportunities beyond passenger vehicles. But rather than go there, I want to shift us just to zoom out a bit and hear about your perspective as a founder in this particular moment. And in particular, as a climate founder, you just raised capital and you're building a company. And I'd be curious, how would you describe this moment of climate entrepreneurship? Clearly, there's an economic slowdown, if not recession, and yet still lots of momentum in the climate tech space. So what's it like being a climate entrepreneur? And, and how would you describe this moment for climate entrepreneurship? Oh, man, I'm, I'm so excited to be in this space at the moment. Um, not only for my personal satisfaction, where we are able to make a huge impact in climate. We have the potential, rather, but we're not making an impact yet. We have the potential to make a huge impact in climate change. But we are so fortunate to have incredible investors that are backing us and supporting our vision and, and, and like being there where we call them at like late night and say, hey, these are the problems that we're facing right now. How do we solve it? It only happens because we have so much alignment internally and externally that are supporting us, right? Timing is also very important for a company. I mean, you know this better than anybody else. If the timing is not right, the company's not going to work. I feel like this is the time better than 
any time in the world where if a founder who's listening here or want to be founder who's like thinking about contemplating uh, jumping into the space, I would say this is the best time ever because what's happening in the market is anytime a recession happens, the hyped up products or hyped up companies, or hyped up industries gets the funding diverted from them into realistic companies that are building practical, deployable, commercializable products. I feel like that's what we're doing at Halo. I feel like that's the biggest advantage that we have. Even in a tough, tough market like this, a foreseeable recession market like this, we have so much interest coming in from the VC community because what we're building is it's practically going to change transportation, right? Which is basics. Even in a recession, you need to get from point A to point B. So that revenue is still there. Unlike, say, if you're in a recession, you try to cut down going out. So you might stop ordering more Uber Eats. It might cut down on your travel a little bit more, right? Although coming out of COVID, everybody's traveling like crazy right now, but you see the pattern, right? In recessions, you kind of cut down the excess. Right? That's what usually people do. But transportation is still integral part of community building. You know, humans, how we go from point A to point B. So that's what I would say, especially combining that basic market that people need basics met with clean tech and climate tech. It's just an incredible time to be alive where we're able to do this 10 years ago, there's no chance. There were not simply not enough climate tech funds out there. And today, there are not only so many early stage VC funds that are switching towards climate, there are early, early, early pre-seed level angels that are switching towards climate. And not only that, the really growth stage, you know, uh, family offices from billionaires that are thinking that, hey, we need to solve the biggest problems for humanity, which is climate change is the biggest problem. So you have the spectrum of capital that you can go after. That's a huge day we're living alive. I'm super happy to be alive right now. Anand, we've covered a lot of ground, and thank you for all the insights that you've shared. This podcast, Invested in Climate, aims to help people do more to address climate change, really across five categories of action, work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism. We've talked a lot today about the lifestyle choice and investment in cars. And I'm curious, what else do you think people should consider doing in their work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism to have the most impact on climate? One word, minimalism. (laughs) All right, you got to say more. If you don't need to buy something, don't buy it. If you go to a grocery store, you're trying to buy a bunch of stuff, say, I don't want plastic. Try to get the paperback. Simple. Great. Anand, thank you so much for your time today and best of luck with Halo. Very excited for your upcoming beta and your commercial launch uh, and to follow all the progress along the way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. Super, super happy to be here. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Invested in Climate. Please remember to rate us on Apple, Spotify, or Google. Find show notes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute financial, accounting, or legal advice. Thanks again.